to buy off. The bottom line is, is that uh, these two companies have a huge opportunity. There are only two companies in an entire sector. My story doesn't start with religion. My story doesn't start with the truth. My story starts with Alma de Shikra, the world of lies. God gave, God took, may his name be blessed. Nitai of Arbel says, distance yourself from a bad neighbor, do not associate with a wicked person, and do not despair of retribution. So Nitai of Arbeli was one of the Tanaim, one of the major sages, one of the leaders, and he's telling you some things that seem like common sense. It doesn't seem like what, this is going to be in Pirkei Avot. This is supposed to be the foundation of wisdom. Distance yourself from a bad neighbor. You need Nitai Arbeli, a Tana that can revive the dead to tell you to go stay away from a bad neighbor. Don't associate with a wicked person. It's, okay, I got it. But then we see the real meaning here. Where it says, do not despair of retribution. We see that what he's saying here doesn't necessarily seem like what it seems like, meaning there's more than meets the eye. So first and foremost, distance yourself from a bad neighbor, he's not talking about a guy that plays music at 3 o'clock in the morning. He's not talking about a guy that throws tomatoes off out of his porch every time you, uh, you, know, you walk under his balcony or parks in your parking lot. He's not talking about that. It could be, but it's not specific to that. He's talking about Archek Mishachen Ra. Ra means wicked against Hashem. Wicked against Hashem. Someone that is going against Hashem. Not necessarily someone that's just going against you. Someone just may dislike you. But that's not necessarily what he's talking about here. This has to be a general statement for everyone. He's talking about Archek Mishachen Ra. is someone that's against Hashem. So we learn here in this week's parasha that Lot went from having one of the giants of all generations of Ram Avinu as, as rabbi, to going to Sodom full of bad neighbors. How could it be? What happened? Lot learned a few years with Avram, decided, you know what, I know just as much as Avram. I'm already learning with him for 20 years, 30 years. I know enough. Decided to be his own rabbi. Said, listen, you have an alachav, how your, uh, your tzon, your sheep, your cattle, eat on your side, and mine on my side, but just in case there may be, uh, my cattle will eat your grass. But there's no guarantee that if my cattle go on your side, they're going to eat your grass. Maybe they're just going to walk around. She looked for kula. He looked for a leniency in alakha. You know, there's a lot of people that learn alakha specifically to look for leniencies. To look for loopholes. Oh, yeah, you can do this. If you do this in a different way, in a shita, then it's okay. If you light the light with your elbow on Shabbat, you're allowed. No, not allowed. If it's by accident, it's less of a chumrah, if you have to. It's a lot more to that, uh, that, to that permission than it says. But somewhere that's looking for a leniency, it's going to find it. The Ramban... Nachmanites calls those people Naval Birshuta Torah. Despicable person with permission of the Torah. Meaning this person specifically learned just to look for leniencies. And this is exactly what Lot did. Lot looked for leniencies. He goes, listen, just because my sheep goes on your side doesn't mean they're going to eat it. So let them go. But then we found out that they did eat. Yeah, but you have proof. You see them? How do you know it's your grass? Maybe they carried it from there. He's looking for excuses. So Avram says, you go right, I'll go left. Go your direction, I'll go my direction. So he becomes his own rabbi. He leaves his rabbi. He thinks he knows more than his rabbi. Shem Yachem, what happens? He goes to Sodom. Becomes a rabbi over there. He's a judge over there. But what judge? What kind of judge he is? 
He judged on cases where it shouldn't even be a case in the first place. Somebody brings a neighbor, somebody brings a uh, guest. If the person is tall, they give him a short bed. If the person is uh, short, they give him a long bed. Why? What's the, what's the difference? If it's a lot, because you're not allowed to bring guests. But if you already brought a guest, we're going to torture that person specially in Sodom. What are they going to do? If he's tall, now that we're going to give him a short bed, if he had the audacity to come visit us and ask for, for tzedakah, ask for anything, we're going to give him a short bed. And whatever body part sticks off the bed, we're going to cut. Now what about if he's short? You give him an extra bed, it's extra comfortable, no? No, no, no. We're going to stretch him out. To reach both sides, which means they're going to kill him. And Lot himself thought that this was a good idea to go and be a judge over there. He goes, no, no, I'll make new rules, I'll make new things. What ends up happening? His daughter brings a guest, and they say, oh, not brings a guest, she gives staka. She gives staka to a homeless person, one of his daughters. So what do they do? So, oh, you're not allowed to give staka. Not allowed to give staka. So what do they do? They take a bunch of honey and they put it all over our body. And they release the bees. And the bees kill her from all the stinging. And that's why there's a, one of the verses says, Vaitzak. There's a scream. There's a scream in Sodom. Who's the scream from? Lot's daughter. He thought that he could be a rabbi over there. Because his rabbi wasn't good enough for him anymore. You understand? So Nitai Arbelil says, Archek Mishachen Ra. Distance yourself from these bad neighbors. Distance yourself from these bad neighbors for yourself, for your own good. The Rambam, in Ilchot Deot, chapter 6, 1, says there's an, there's an obligation. It says there's an obligation for, for a person to move. If his neighborhood, if his community is full of reshaim, is full of wicked people, full of, you know, uh, people that are going against the Torah, not interested in tshuva, not interested in anything relevant to the Torah, you're obligated to move, you're not allowed to live there. So then the next she'ela is, the next question is, okay, what if there's, every place is like that. I live in, uh, I live in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, I go to... Smith Street, it's Sodom and Gomorrah. I go to Park Street, it's Sodom and Gomorrah. It's everything is Sodom and Gomorrah. What happens? I'm in Manhattan. What do I do? Rambam says, move to the desert. Your neighbor should be the scorpion and the snake. This is halacha. It's not like a, uh, uh, some uh, weird uh, midrash that no one's ever heard of that I found myself. It's halacha. He says, move to the desert. Scorpion and the snake are better neighbors than rasha. Because at least if they kill you, they kill your, only your body. Whereas the Rasha is going to kill your soul forever, Shem Rechem. It's Alakha. So now you have to understand the significance of getting away from this. This is why also it says, Archek Mishachen Ra, Velo Itrachek. Archek means remove yourself from the bad neighbor. Technically, it should say, itrachek, which means distance yourself. Go live somewhere else. Oh, achek means you can't even be friends with them. You have a shopper, you have a person that's an atheist, no interest in tshuva, no interest in nothing, goes against the Torah openly, has no, uh, mocks the Torah, makes fun of things. Oh, look at this rabbi. Look what he said. Ha, ha, ha. Like one of these idiots on YouTube. Has a YouTube channel with 300,000 followers making fun of the Torah. Making fun of this. His whole life is just making fun of the Torah. This is his whole life. They're going to use all the, all the content that he used as nice introduction to his genom when he gets there. And he finds out that it's true. The Torah is real. But you have some, fortunately, you have many people like that in our generation. A lot of people make fun of the Torah. Not necessarily everybody has a YouTube channel. But as many people that are putting yourself as a, in such, such a bad way where they become machtia rabin. They become, they, 
cause other people to sin. And this is the essence of a Shachen Ra. A Shachen Ra is not just someone that is just bad by himself and he's just like sitting in his home, he just smokes on Shabbat by himself. Shachen Ra is talking about this one, this person is a Rasha. This person makes other people sin. He brings everybody else to have a hookah party on Shabbat afternoon. This is the person that invites everybody to the strip club. This is the person that has the Super Bowl party on the same day that there is a Shi'ut Torah. Knowing that all of those people are going to miss the Shi'ut Torah, but now who cares? Put God on hold. Go tomorrow. Go next week. This is a Machtia Rabim. And these people are Mamash Miskenim. And the Rambam says, and al says, you're not allowed to be friends with them. You have to do exactly what it said in last week's parasha. Lech lecha, move, cut yourself off. Cut yourself off. You cannot, you cannot stay connected to these people. And that's why it says, Al titchaber l'rasha. Do not associate it with the wicked person. Now obviously, titchaber means connect to him. Now if you're in a business of doing kiruv, this makes it very, very difficult. If you have family, like pretty much everyone in Am Yisrael, that has people that are secular in your family, friends that are secular, people you care about that are secular, this is a very, very critical thing to listen to. Al titchaber la'asha. What does it mean, al titchaber? Don't be so connected to them. Yes, you're allowed to come in, teach, leave. But don't start having barbecues on a daily basis. The guy is at your house. Sometimes he's bringing pigs. Sometimes he's bringing monkeys. Sometimes he's bringing this. And you make a separate side of barbecue. Let him eat this tarif. No, no, no. You come to our house for Shabbat. You become Shomer Shabbat. You don't drive to my house. And then drive home on Shabbat. You want to come to my house, keep Shabbat. Stay in my house for Shabbat. Can't stay for Shabbat. Don't bring that stuff to my house. Why? Why don't bring that stuff to my house? Why don't drive to my house on Shabbat and go home on Shabbat? Because I have little kids. Little kids, my little kids, it's a dikim. They don't know what a chiloni is. They don't know what a secular person is. They see somebody driving on Shabbat that I'm honoring and saying, Ah, oh, look, this is my friend Svika, this is Shmuli, and this is Danny. They all came to celebrate Shabbat with us and after we talk and we schmooze and we talk about Avraham Avinu and Moshe Rabbeinu and all these wonderful things and everybody smiles and everybody eats and everybody celebrates okay good night everybody and they go and the little kids see him from the window tick 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 turn the car and they drive Abba what happened to Avraham Avinu and Moshe Rabbeinu they said don't drive on Shabbat why is uh, Danny and Shmuley and Tzvika driving what are you going to say to them? No, they don't know? What are you going to tell them? The kid's not going to understand they don't know. You just talked about Moshe Rabbeinu. It seemed like they knew fine. So you can't connect to them to such an extent that you let them sin inside your house. Listen, I understand it's difficult. Some even say, listen, if you can invite them the first time and they drive the next time, don't let them. Personally, I don't think you should let them sin at all, ever. Because if it's okay once, why is it not okay twice? If it's okay for him to drive on Shabbat for one year, why is it not okay for him to drive for two years? And then three years, and four years, and five years, and ten years? It's either true or it's not. The fact that he's not willing to accept it right away and keep Shabbat right away, I understand. But, you have to let him know that, listen, when you're here, when you're in my house, you have to keep it. Just like if you go to a house where it's part of the etiquette of the house to take off your shoes when you come in, what do you do? You take off your shoes. If it's part of the etiquette of the house to take off your hat when you come in, what do you do? You take off your hat. You do what is the custom in the place that you go. There's no different than anything else. You want to go to the house for Shabbat, go to the house for Shabbat. But to have these people that are completely anti-Torah over your house and allowing them to desecrate Shabbat openly like that is going to create problems in your life. It's going to create problems in your life. And you have, to, you have to really be strict with it, even though it may mean that you're going to have less guests for Shabbat. Rather have less guests for Shabbat than people that are going to taint your kids and tell your kids that it's okay 
to drive on Shabbat and uh, the car doesn't blow up. When you turn it on on Shabbat. Because really all you have to stand on with little kids, this is one of the things that people don't understand. With little kids, if you want kids to stick to Judaism, to stick to Torah, without letting go, without, sac without uh, you know, just Ramah sticking to it, you have only two things to hold on to. One, reward them. Give them a reward. Kid wore a keeper the whole week, give them a candy. Give them a little, a little story. Give them a high five. Wear a tzitzit, give him a little story. Give him a little high five. Give him candy. Give him something. Give Reward him for something. He learned his mishnayot. He learned his chumash. He did his homework. Give him some reward. That's one thing you have to stand on. Chazal says this. It's not my rules. Chazal says you must reward them. This is in the days of Chazal. It's not just days of now. Days of now, Shem you should probably give him a plane. But obviously you have to give rewards with, uh, with taste, with tact. You can't give the kid a plane every week. Give him a candy. Give him something small. He'll also appreciate something small much more than he will if you buy him a video game every week and ruin him. So that's number one. You want to educate your kid? You want him to, to want to do the mitzvah? You have to entice him with that. The second thing is, which is going to be a surprise to some people, is fear. Scare him to death. God doesn't like when people take off their kippah. God doesn't like people who don't do their homework. God, and you have to let them know. The fear of God, you tell them one time to a kid, they'll listen forever. They'll listen forever, I'm telling you. I know this for myself. When I was a little kid, even though we didn't keep any, you know, much mitzvot. When we were, I was 10 years old, we kept a few things. We went to a uh, religious uh, school. But as soon as we landed in America, we became green. Didn't keep anything, except holidays and, you know, basic. In my opinion, we didn't keep much, but whatever. Some people may consider it mesotee, you know, just like uh, part of the stuff. In my opinion, based on what I know today, we kept nothing. But it doesn't make a difference. The point is, is that we came in, we keep some holidays, kosher whenever it's convenient. But what did I make sure to do my whole life? No matter what, doesn't matter if I'm dating a non-Jew, doesn't matter if I'm uh, doing whatever, doesn't matter if I'm eating taref, doesn't matter if anything. What am I doing my whole life? There's two things I did my whole life. One, every time I have a piece of paper, always put Bezrat Hashem on top right. Top right corner of the, of the paper. Anytime I write anything on a piece of paper, always had Bezrat Hashem. The, the bet and the hay. And the second thing is, Sheesh my sleep before I go to sleep. Why? Because my mom told me this is what God wants. When I was a little kid, said, listen, or my teacher told me about Bezrat Hashem, and my mom told me about Shema Yisrael. It's good to say before you go to sleep. God wants it. God is almighty. God is great. God is everything. Nobody told me God uh, punishes people who don't keep Shabbat. People told me, God wants you to say Shema Yisrael before you go to sleep. God wants you to put his name on a piece of paper. Okay, so that's what I did. You tell little kids, this is what God said. You put the fear of God in them, they'll do it. And that's the only thing you have to hold on to until they have enough Torah knowledge that they learn in school, Bezat Hashem, and at home, that it's become part of them and they want to do it. But before you get to Ava, before you get to love of Hashem and desire to do His will, you have to have Yira. You have to have fear. There's no Ava without Yira. So this is also another reason why it's very, very dangerous to have reshaim in your life. If you have a community full of reshaim, full of people that are wicked, full of people that are against the Torah, they could ruin your kids. This is also why you unfortunately hear sometimes that uh, rabbis that you know, move to new communities that are full of secular people, trying to help them do tshuva. And sometimes their own kids, the rabbi's kids get tainted, get hurt because of this. The kid goes off the derech. Because the rabbi can't be with his kids all day. You know, as the community, he has to learn, he has this, he has a lot of things to do. So his own kid's going to grow up. He's going to play, well, who's going to play with? He's going to play with the secular kids. He sees them smoking, he wants to smoke. He, says that he sees them drinking, he wants to drink. He sees this... He, 
So that's what happens. So you, so it's it's a very very big problem. It's a very very big problem, and uh, it's very dangerous to pee in a place like that. It's better to not go. Uh, in, in most cases, but it's also messy with nefesh. The rabbi Bezal Hashem will have enough siat lishmai that his kids do tshuva. But nonetheless, the point is that the uh, Mishnah here is telling you that when you are next to, connected to Rishayim, you are going to be infected by it. You're going to be infected by it. I've heard enough. New arrival screams echoing through the hallway to know that this ain't good. Once they pass them through the infierno, they don't come back. It's enough to make you go crazy. Do not think we fear you, spirit. We know your power is born of evil. This is your last night in the land of the living. Do you understand me, my little demon? that lived here called the Hetheringtons and unfortunately their daughter passed away of a heart attack inside the house. Basically they were so devastated that they reached out to people claiming to be psychic mediums. They actually weren't psychic mediums. They opened up a total of 11 portals inside this house and invited spirits and entities from all different kinds of dimensions. Well I think there are certain pieces of evidence that there is an afterlife. The resurrection of the dead is affirmed uh, pretty clearly uh, in the Talmud and the Midrash. To be honest with you, to give this lecture is a nightmare. If it was up to me, I wouldn't. There's going to be some graphic details. This place is a maze. The person after death went to a place called Sheol. This is by far the largest near-death experience study that has ever been conducted. People go to a place and they experience weird things. And sometimes they actually will see a character of some type. Well, where did that come from? I don't know why that one chain is swinging back there. They may describe feeling profoundly peaceful, seeing a bright, warm, welcoming light. Some people describe watching doctors and nurses working on them with incredible accuracy. Next thing I knew, I was above my body watching the operation. How long did you feel like you were gone? I went to a place of timelessness. And so what that means, it could have been a second. It could have been five minutes. I don't know.
Can you imagine waking up from your sleep and not being able to move? As I'm lying there, I realized that there's a, an evil presence next to me. Do you believe that angels, demons exist? Oh my god, dude! Strange things keep happening. Bizarre nightmares, as if I'm on fire. <gasps> Whoa, what the hell is this? Man, I've got bad chest pain. Satan's Hollow is what it's called, the portal to hell. Some people calling it an eye of fire, while others said it looked like the portal to hell opening up. <laughs> Thing I know, I was outside of my body looking at my body. What I'm going to do is called claromancy, the art of throwing lots or throwing bones. 2,000 years of experience passed down, recorded, of how demons work. God has them all on a leash, and he lets the leash go enough to let them tempt us because that's what makes us spiritually stronger. I'm trying to be as graphic as possible so you understand what we're talking about. It's your ticket to reality. It's your ticket to freedom. It's your ticket to immortality. Is there an afterlife? Is there a it's God? It's the type of information that can keep you away from yourself. What happens to us after we die?